Welcome everyone to the Heritage Science Academy series of webinars organized by the project Iperion Heritage Science and by the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science. My name is Matthias Sterlich and I'll be moderating the webinar today, which is in fact our second user meeting. This is uh, one in series of three user meetings in which we present or rather invite our speakers to present successful and interesting access projects carried out in the frame of the Iperion HS project. Uh, we have two really special talks today, and these are going to take us into the depths of the medieval age, but the first one is a rather more global talk to be given by Lucrezia Milillo. She is going to talk to us about meaningful materials in the Kipu code. Lucrezia is a PhD student and Wolfson scholar in social anthropology in the department at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Her research aims to further our understanding of Andean Kipus which are colorful knotted cords used as writing in the Andes for 14 centuries, before, during, and after the Inca Empire. It combines ethnographic fieldwork with morphological and scientific study to new insights into the significance of color and materials in the product, used in the production of Andean quipus. Lucrezia, over to you. Uh, well, hi everyone, and uh, thank you, Mattia, for your introduction. Um, uh, thank you, everyone in the audience, for for being here. Um, I'll skip my introduction then. Thank you, for, Mattia, for such a wonderful uh, presentation. And I will start presenting the the object of my PhD research, and then I will talk about the analysis that um, that we did. Also, thanks to uh, IP and HS um, access. Uh, in fact, um, all right, um, as uh, every time you will see, I will mention a laboratory if there is the um, orange uh, kind of label next to it, uh, you will understand that it has been accessed through the uh, Iperion uh, HS funding. So what are kipus? Uh, kipus are um, colorful knotted string devices uh, that were used for record keeping by the Incas. Uh, the, the territory that they would control at the end of their expansion is the one portrayed in the map on, on the left. As you can imagine, it's a very vast one. Peru is only this tiny part in it. Um, and as you can see from the uh, image to the right-hand side, they would use quipus to record information and to also share it. So. Um, it was they wouldn't use writing on a surface as we do today, but they will use kipus instead. Uh, a very general and um, like uh, schematic representation of a of a kipu, um, just to understand how they are and and, and how are they made. Uh, they have a top cord from which many pendants are hanging, and from these pendants, other pendants, subsidiary cords can hang. They can be very complex in structure. In fact, uh, how cords were attached to the primary cord and how they were spoon and slide was important and was used for uh, conveying uh, meaning. Uh, what we kipu itself is a word that means not in in Quechua. It's one of the words for knots. Uh, this one means not on on the same cord. In fact, they would use knots in a decimal position system to uh, register numbers. And um, as you can see at the lower level, they would write the units, they would <laughs> not the units. And then the tens are on the upper level and the hundreds on the upper level again and again. Um, so with different types of knots at different levels, they would write numbers. But the big question in, in Kipu studies is, uh, what are these numbers counting? and uh, what do we do with keepers that do not present knots arranged in a base, uh, base 10 system? So the problem is how was the qualitative and possibly the narrative information encoded in keepers? And what keepers scholars are, agree upon today is that both materials and colors were very important. Keepers could be 
made of cotton or Andean cotton or uh, wool. Um, as we shall see in a minute, they actually would also use other plant fibers and they would use natural colors of these materials as well as uh, dyes to, to change the color of, of the fibers. And dyes uh, and, and natural colors could be, made, be used to make uh, very interesting color patterns on single cords. We see uh, um, um, single color cords, mottled cords, uh, barber pole and segmented cords here. But these are only like just a few of the very complex patterns that keeper cords can have. And cords can be arranged in colorful patterns in a whole keeper. Here we can see color bending or, or seriation, in this case, series of different colors uh, repeat over and over again in, in the Kipu. So in a few words, um, my PhD project aims to expand our understanding of what Kipu might mean through the study of meaningful material. Because if it's quite uh, straightforward to see that Kipu fibers are materials that were used in, our, in this semiotic system, uh, colors have never been addressed before from a perspective that takes into account their materiality and their deterioration. So uh, this is how meaningful materials in the Kipu code uh, takes form. And um, if you want to read more about it, you can check out my, my website. Um, because this research is actually um, quite big. I, I mean, I collaborated with six European museums and five different laboratories, three of which uh, were funded by the Iperion Network uh, project. And for this research, I've selected uh, two types of kipus presenting oddities, unusual specimens that are said to be outside the Inca standard, which is what I, I showed to you uh, before in the first part. And uh, without diving into anthropological research questions on this matter, because we don't have, this is not the, the right place to do that. Um, I will just mention that uh, leaf fiber, uh, this leaf fiber you see on the right hand side has not been yet identified and no dye analysis uh, have been done on, on kipus before. So you can imagine the magnitude of the importance of this information to, to understand, to understand kipus better. These are the, the museums I, I collaborated with and that host the kipus uh, that were included in, in this study. And um, it was very useful for me to uh, have a dialogue with the, the Iperion help desk because they uh, really put me in contact with the experts in the field and um, allow me to, to design together with Marai Hake, a fantastic scientist at the Swedish National Heritage Board, uh, she was able to translate in the science language what were my anthropological questions. And so that's, that's I think, the, the fantastic aspect of the collaboration, uh, collaborative work that is enabled by the Iperion HS axis. So then we decided, we, we designed a, a protocol, how to proceed. Ideally, this is an ideal protocol that we try to follow. Not all the samples, of course, in practice, were able to go through all the steps. We had to make a selection. Um, and this was part of the, of the fun of this, of designing this research project. So we started with the morphological study that I would do on the Kipu itself. Uh, then when possible, uh, we did multispectral imaging and XRF in situ on the artifact in order to assess whether, where was more um, ideal to, to proceed with the sampling. And if this was not possible, just after the most morphological study, I would uh, point at uh, specific areas that were um, where we wanted to sample from. So then we proceeded with uh, bringing all the samples. All the samples were uh, went through the micro XRF in, in vacuum that was done at Historic England in Portsmouth. Um, we also did, we also imaged the samples with UV light, visible light, polarized microscopy and in the SCM in, uh, in Sweden. We proceeded in, uh, we brought the samples to Ljubljana at the Macromolecular Laboratory to do Raman spectroscopy, SERS and FTIR. Uh, so this analysis at the center 
uh, in the central column, they are, of course, invasive because you need to take a sample, but they are non-destructive. So you can reuse the samples to do other types of analysis, which are destructive, like high performance uh, liquid chromatography in dial array detection or um, in mass spectrometry. And of course, uh, radiocarbon dating is, is destructive as well. So uh, for the most morphological uh, analysis, uh, it can be, I mean, many things can be found. It's not just an observation. In this case, this uh, black thing was sticking out of, of this thread wrapping. And in the XRF in situ, we were able to identify a thread running through, which enables a different understanding of the very structure of the Kivu and uh, uh, multispectral imaging with uh, UV light uh, enabled us to see a cord that was supposed to be made of a uniform color it was in, instead possibly mottled in the past. So after proceeding with the sampling, as already said, we brought the samples to, to, um, to map them uh, with multispectral imaging, uh, but also to analyze them with different microscopes I already mentioned. But let's get to uh, Portsmouth, where actually mapping with uh, X-ray fluorescence in vacuum was performed. This was really useful to map inorganic composition and possibly mordants of the samples. Uh, we, we, it was really useful to, to do that in vacuum because we were looking for uh, aluminium, which cannot detect, be detected in, in open air. Um, but we didn't find any, as you can see, at the bottom left, which is still an information that uh, is useful in a way. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not gonna go in detail. Many observations can be done regarding XRF analysis. Uh, for example, um, uh, iron was present particularly on colored samples uh, and on sample seven, the one to the right. This is just a few of all the samples we analyzed. I couldn't put all of them in this slide, uh, but just to give you an idea, it's possible that iron um, was, uh, was used uh, as a mordant. And uh, this particular sample here came from the core that we thought was made of a uniform uniform color, but the two parts of it that I'm indicating now at the moment with a pointer uh, show different um, uh, amount of iron in them. So it, it actually supports the idea uh, suggested by uh, photography in UV light that that cord was mottled and not uh, of a uniform solid color. Um, if you want to know more about this type of research, there is already an output that came out uh, from, from this research. Um, it's uh, open access, uh, it's published on uh, Heritage MDPI journal, so you can read about further details on methodology and what we found um, regarding this. Uh, but what was really fun is that in, uh, in Portsmouth, they also have an archaeobotanical laboratory at the lower level, and so uh, we also used the expertise of, of, of Jill Campbell, who helped um, us imaging the, the vegetable fibers that we analyzed before, but it was a very fruitful environment uh, for, for discussion. Um, we moved then to uh, Ljubljana to detect uh, possible uh, inorganic and organic uh, colorants with uh, Raman and, uh, and SERS. Uh, they really need a very minuscule quantity of fiber, uh, just in some cases, just a couple of hair. So it's not like a liquid chromatography that need a bit more, which is still tiny, but still, I mean, it depends on how much um, we are allowed to, to sample and how destructive the sample can be for the object. But it's good to know that different results, the same results can be uh, accessed through different ways and different amounts of, of samples. This is something I learned uh, in the process. Um, you also need to know that, um, for example, Peruvian cotton can naturally be of different colors. Uh, all the cotton tufts that you see here are undyed. Uh, and so at the same time, I mean, it, if you cannot analyze everything with, with chromatography and you can't sample, because you can't sample everything in, in the Kipu, it's really useful to be able to take a couple of, of, uh, of hair, uh, in this case of, of cotton, and uh, detect whether the color that we see uh, is actually dye or not with, uh, with Raman and, and SERS. 
Uh, but in Ljubljana, they also have uh, FTIR, and we use that to study the quantity of, of lignin in the vegetable fibers that are still not identified. And we will match the information gathered with FTIR with uh, uh, microscopic imaging that we did in consulting an archaeobotanist it will be also helpful to find out specifically which kind of plant was used. Uh, finally, some samples were selected for uh, high performance liquid chromatography, uh, which uh, happened in the, in Pisa, and uh, well, uh, it was performed by the professor Ilaria Degano. It was really useful to have further details on organic dyes, which is of course different if we want to um, look at uh, pigments. In this case, it is excellent for for organic material. But again, uh, if you want to read more about this, there is this first result that came out. And uh, finally, going towards the end of my uh, presentation, last but not least, we also uh, I'm very happy about this radiocarbon dated uh, six uh, kipus, uh, which is a huge amount because out of the twelve hundreds, uh, very few have been uh, dated so far. And uh, most of the kipus lack precise provenance. Therefore, radiocarbon dating is fundamental for finding how morphological changes in kipus can be related to cultural changes over time. Um, and due to the period of history in which uh, the rise and fall of the Incas happened, actually radiocarbon dating also needs to go hand in hand with morphological and archival uh, work. Uh, these results are still unpublished, so I'm not going to show them here yet, uh, but we are working on it. And um, it, in general, it was great to learn so much about the very practicalities of science, how to design a feasible protocol that would satisfy both uh, scientific needs, but also curator curatorial and anthropological preoccupations. Uh, it was of great value learning the affordances and limits of specific uh, machines and to understand the invaluable uh, expertise of the scientists I collaborated with, which is what really made the difference in terms of personal experience, but also uh, scientific results. Uh, so without taking uh, extra time, thank you for your attention. I guess the questions are after the second uh, talk, but in any case, these are my contacts. Feel free to get in touch here or, or later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucrezia. This was phenomenally interesting. And I must say that my head is buzzing with questions. So I'm sure we're looking uh, at uh, questions posed by our audience uh, to be discussed at the end. Uh, without further ado, however, I'd like to invite the second presenter, uh, who is Maria Albrecht who's going to talk to us about conservation of the painting Madonna and Throne by Joan Reichach. Maria Albrecht is a paintings conservator in The Hague, based in The Hague, and she works both uh, freelance and at the Mauritz House. She graduated from the postgraduate program in conservation and restoration of cultural heritage at the University of Amsterdam in 2014. She has published widely on material technical studies of 17th century Dutch paintings and 15th century Spanish paintings. This presentation, however, focuses on the conservation and material technical analysis of the Madonna and Throne, surrounded by angels attributed to Joan Reichach from the collection Foundation de Haar in Utrecht. Maria, really looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you. I hope everyone can see me uh, and hear me correctly. Maybe a thumbs up would be nice. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share uh, to share a bit more about our project. And I will be talking specifically about our Arch Lab uh, visit to the Spanish Cultural Heritage Agency. Um, uh, does this work? Yeah. So this is it. Um, we were granted access to the uh, uh, Instituto del Patrimonio Cultural de España in, in Madrid through uh, Arch Lab funding. And uh, we went last year in April. Um, and this project for the project and for the Arch Lab uh, request, I was the group leader, but it's been a, a, 
uh, a project that I have been contributing or have been uh, sharing with my colleagues, uh, Melissa Dougherty and Gert van Gerven. And I thought it's important to note that the three of us are working as freelance conservators. So I'm extra grateful that even if you're not uh, working with a grant institution, but uh, on your own, that uh, you're still eligible to um, get funding through ArchLab, which I think is really great. Uh, and I think more people should know about this because it's a really good opportunity. Um, then I'll introduce um, our object. Uh, it's a painting attributed to the, the uh, Valencian artist John Reichach. Uh, the painting is dated 1450 or circa 1450, 1475, and it belongs to the collection of Castel de Haar or the Haar Castle near Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, it's unclear when the painting exactly arrived in the castle, uh, but we assume or we know from historic photos that it was at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it's important to note that Spanish art from this period is extremely rare in the Netherlands. I think Spanish art in general in Dutch public collections is a bit underrepresented, but Spanish art from the 15th century hardly exists. So this is really uh, an, a unique painting in, in public collections in the Netherlands. And basically the painting, since it had been acquired by the castle, um, yeah, has been more or less ignored by specialists, but also by the general public. So the general public in the Netherlands doesn't really know, isn't really aware of this painting. Um, and in order to change that, um, we undertook uh, conservation treatment, but this conservation treatment was combined with material, material technical research because this painting is quite rare and quite beautiful. So we wanted to get as much information as we knew or as we could. Um, and for this material technical research, we did um, mostly imaging. So we took high, high uh, resolution images with visual light and with ultraviolet light, but we also did infrared reflectography and uh, X radiography. Um, and the conservation treatment was a full treatment, so to say. So it entailed removal of varnish and non-original surface layers. Um, a bit of structural treatment, varnishing, and then varnishing, filling, and retouching to, to finish it. Um, so since there are hardly any Spanish 15th century paintings in the Netherlands, there is, there is really no comparison to this painting, and it can be quite hard to find the context for our painting. So during treatment, we ran into certain aspects or questions that required further analysis. Um, such as structural details that seemed non-original, and then there was also the presence of a, a grey surface layer. Um, so basically the aim of our Arch Lab visit was to better understand the materials and techniques used by Reichach by studying the data available at the IPCE regarding uh, Reichach, Jacomart and contemporaries, so other Spanish 15th century artists. Um, so we had a focus on the material and techniques, materials and techniques used in the paint layers, but also uh, in the carved tracery, the wood, the wood carving and, and construction techniques. Um, and here you see images of so the reverse of the painting, the reverse of the Dehar painting, and then uh, two uh, detailed photographs of this gray surface layer. So during our visit at uh, IPCE, we studied the data present on uh, paintings by Reichach and Chacomar. And these mostly, the data mostly consisted of X-radiographs uh, and paint constructions, oh, sorry, paint cross-sections, um, and analysis of these cross-sections and uh, treatment reports. Um, and all the data was, um, the data that they had there was from this altarpiece, which is dedicated to St. Anne, and two separate panels, which, you, which are shown here on the side. Uh, this entire ensemble has been attributed to Reichach or Giacomart or both. And this attribution question is uh, quite complicated and it goes a bit too far to go into it here because um, oh yeah, there's been this whole history of attribution and deattribution. Uh, to either one artist or the other and then there are scholars who also say they contributed so it's a complicated question uh, but for sure this is the context for our painting in in utrecht in the netherlands 
Uh, it's important to note that the current framing that you see on this image uh, dates from the 18th century and is not original. Um, so this is uh, our painting, the, the Haar panel painting. And as you can see, um, it looks, the, the structural uh, form of it looks quite original. So the panel is made up of five boards. And these five boards are joined by cross beams. Uh, some of them are missing, as you already see here. And um, well, we had some doubts when looking at the finials on either side, we thought they looked a bit funny. There was also some missing element that we have seen, like the central carved element. We had seen it in historical photographs, but it now went missing. So we knew something was up, but we weren't quite sure how to explain all of this. Uh, the x-rays did show us some more, so um, you can see that the lower railing uh, has been added later and there's modern screws used to, to uh, apply this, so this is for sure a modern uh, intervention. And uh, the x-radiograph also showed that this, the finials had been cut down at one point um, and they are currently reattached with wooden dowels. Um, so it was super valuable for us to be able to compare our x-ray to x-rays of other paintings uh, by these artists. Um, mostly also because x-rays are not very often published. So there are, of course, articles, there's literature on painting techniques by 15th century Spanish artists. Uh, but x-rays are, yeah, as far as I have found, not very often published. So it's, for us to be able to, to compare these x-rays with our x-rays was very uh, valuable. And um, it has shown, um, yeah, it has provided us with the context and it helped us understand the changes to our panel a lot better. So the construction technique of the, the, um, the, x, the panels that we saw the x-rays from in Spain uh, are very similar. So there's cross beams and uh, also metal dowels in between the boards. Uh, but all the panels we saw there basically had um, a clear layout. And that is that there is a, um, a horizontal bar at the bottom and a horizontal bar at the top. And the cross, the cross bars, the, the place where they cross is exactly in the center of the panel. And with our painting, this is not the case. So uh, this led us to conclude that our painting has been cut down at the top. Um, so the, the upper crossbar is missing completely. And um, well, the, the finials have been shortened, so they would have been longer and they would have extended all the way up to the top of the panel. Uh, we believe that um, the area that's now cut off uh, was filled with carved and gilded tracery, as we have seen in other examples, uh, other examples of altarpieces by this, this artist. So another um, aspect that we focused on was this, uh, this gray surface layer. Uh, during varnish removal, or actually after varnish removal, um, yeah, the surface of the painting still looked a bit dark and even, and also quite dirty, actually. Um, and upon closer inspection, it became clear that there was still a, a gray surface layer present on the surface. So this layer didn't fluoresce and it also, it wasn't soluble in, uh, in, in solvents. Um, but before testing to remove the layer, we wanted to identify what it was, um, because we were suspecting that it could be remnants possibly of a, of an original egg white varnish layer. And if this was the case, then it, of course, leads to another question, like, should you want to remove this layer if it is an original layer? Uh, so in order to, to study this further, we actually took samples back at home before our art lab visit. Um, and we studied the samples together with the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency. Um, but it was very valuable for us to, to bring our, not the samples, but the results uh, to uh, Spain and to, to have discussions with uh, the experts there uh, because they have way more experience in dealing with paintings like this um, and they could share their thoughts and all their knowledge with us. So it was uh, really valuable. Um, so here you see a cross-section that was taken prior to going to Madrid 
uh, it's taken in the cloak of an angel in the lower part of the painting and on top you see a very thin uh, gray layer and before it um, so the, the cross section was further analyzed using uh, scanning electron microscopy and actually this was quite inconclusive um, so we couldn't really uh, identify the layer based on this cross section uh, but I think together with the, the experts uh, in Spain, we've decided that it was um, very useful to to take extra samples and to try and um, find out what this layer is uh, and to see if we could remove it safely. Um, so that was very valuable for us as well. So I guess uh, the results of our visit would be that uh, the comparison of our painting with the data um, from IPCE helped us understand the structural aspects of the painting a lot better. Um, so the Arch Lab funding resulted in a, in a better understanding of the materials and the techniques used to create the Dahar painting. And the discussions with the experts at IPCE and especially their knowledge on the presence of original egg white varnish layers, yes or no, um, was really uh, very valuable to us and this led to new insights which made us take extra samples once we got back home and do further tests um, and this eventually resulted in a, a safe way to remove this gray surface layer um, and you see a picture of this happening here so on the right you see the, a cleaned area and on the left you see an area where the varnish has been removed but this gray surface layer is still present and i think the removal of this layer has made a huge difference for uh for this painting um so all in all i would say that's a, a very yeah valuable result of the arch lab visit and um, then the impact of our visit. So we, we've tried to share our findings in several places. Uh, we started by uh, giving a lecture at the, the picture meeting, which is a, a yearly, more or less, a yearly meeting organized by the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency. And it's specifically aimed at uh, painting conservators. Uh, so it was really nice to uh, share our findings with our, our peers, so to say. Uh, we also shared um, our information with volunteers at the castle that uh, owns the collection or owns the painting. And I think that's also very valuable because these are the people who uh, share this uh, or share their love of th this castle with the public. So when the public comes in, they, uh, they are welcoming them. They're telling them all the stories. So now they have extra stories to tell about this unique painting because beforehand no one really knew actually. Um, we were able to present a poster at a, a symposium in Madrid uh, last October and then uh, we're very happy uh, to share that uh, a paper of ours is accepted for ICOMCC's Triennial Conference in Valencia next September. So um, these are the people I'm... Uh, I'm very uh, grateful of. So at the IPCE, we worked together with these people um, and they were super welcoming, very nice, and they shared all of their knowledge with us, which was great. So of course, thanks to Iperion IHS, we were able to do this. Uh, Katrin Timmers is the curator of the castle and our uh, conservation, um, our conservation project, conservation slash research project, has been funded by the Vereniging Rembrandt and the Prins Bernard Couture Funds, um, which is also good, good to acknowledge because they specifically also funded the research part, not only the treatment, but also the research part. Um, so I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. And then I believe I'm uh, switching over back to Mattia for the last two slides, if I'm correct. Thank you so much, Maria. This was uh, such a comprehensive and uh, really, really interesting presentation of the challenges related to this painting preservation. Um, what remains is uh, for the Heritage Science Academy team to invite our audience to attend our next event. This is another user meeting event, the third one in the series and sadly the last one. 
our user meeting events are there to showcase successful access projects and to um, disseminate what can be done using the Iperion HS and the Iris infrastructure. So the next uh, user meeting event is going to be held on September 12th at 3 p.m. So please do join us then for a presentation of further two interesting projects. If you could please advance the slide, Maria. And of course, our uh, slightly younger uh, team of uh, HS Academy Current Topics Lecture Series is inviting you to the next webinar or rather online lecture to be given by Livio De Luca, uh, who has um, worked on um, a cathedral of digital data and multidisciplinary knowledge in heritage science in relation to his project on digitization and digital data related to Notre Dame conservation. I'm sure this is going to be a really, really inspiring talk as well. And this is going to be held on the 22nd of June at 3 p.m. as well. Uh, we are extremely busy in the Heritage Science Academy team, and we are also very happy to be able to invite everyone to attend the July Summer School, uh, which is going to be held in Ljubljana, Slovenia on Build Heritage. So please do check our Heritage Science Academy website for all the events, as well as recordings of the past webinars and lecture series. Thanks to everyone in the Iperion HS Central Office for support with the uh, webinar today, with the user meeting today. And all that I still need to say is that our call for proposals, so the Iperion Heritage Science call for proposals, is still open until the end of June, 30th of June of 2023. And I trust that the two extremely, extremely interesting presentations today have given everyone new ideas on what is possible within our research infrastructure. Thank you very much for attending today.